Okay, friends, we're going to finish up finally. Uh, it's been a long hiatus, but finish up finally the uh, PowerPoint on energy transfer uh, ecosystem dynamics. Um, and uh, then um, we'll be done with that. We can talk about the other ecology stuff. <clears throat> and hopefully you will have all of that wrapped up by the time I see you um, in the unspeakable month uh, of September. Okay, um, let's go ahead and begin. Uh, this whole last section of this PowerPoint is just dealing with transferring energy from its original source uh, for us here on the surface of the planet. That's going to be the sun. Uh, we talked a little bit about that before and into the living organisms uh, and what becomes of that energy as it passes from one living thing to the next. Um, so something to remember, as we've already mentioned, nutrients cycle. Nutrients are the building blocks. They are the Legos and they are reused constantly. You build something, you take it apart. That's decomposition. You build something, you take it apart. You use atoms and molecules to build an organism, take it apart, and then they are reused. The nutrients that are here on the planet have been here since the planet formed, and they will always be here as long as the planet is here. They are not going anywhere. However, something that is more transient than that is the energy. Energy is coming for us on the surface of this planet from the sun, and it is very ephemeral. It is going to, you use it, um, uh, and then once you've used it, it is not usable anymore. Uh, it isn't that it's disappeared. Remember, our you know matter uh, can neither be created nor destroyed. Uh, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. They can be transformed. Okay, so. Uh, we can transform it, and it's just that when we transform this energy, it becomes really unusable to us. Okay, so energy flow through ecosystems. This is stuff you've gotten since you were teeny weeny little people, so this is nothing new. The sun, via the light that comes from the sun, not the heat, but the light, is what is giving us energy. Um, and it is being harnessed by the producers, otherwise known as the plants. Those producers, once they are consumed by the primary level consumers, usually herbivores, uh, but could be omnivores as well, uh, that energy is passed to them. Now, not all of that energy is passed to them, which is what you see as this pyramid we're building gets smaller and smaller towards the top. Uh, the energy of the producers passes to the consumers, but not all of the energy of those producers is passed to the consumers. And same goes for the secondary level consumers. Again, some energy is lost and a lesser amount gets passed to them and so on. So energy is lost at, a, at each trophic level, even though some of it is passed straight up to the, the next level at um, in the, in the uh, pyramid. So. Um, this is just going in a little detail with that and reminding you of some terms. Trophic levels, again, are just those levels through which energy passes in an ecosystem uh, based on feeding relationships. And of course, you already know it starts with energy from the sun being captured by plants, also known as producers. Please do remember that because energy is lost a little bit as, as it passes through each trophic level, you cannot have an infinitely large lo trophic level pyramid. It cannot go on forever. It is limited because you're losing some energy as you go up. So generally speaking, the biggest pyramid you're going to get is four or five levels. And please remember our terms. Primary consumers are those that eat the producers directly. Secondary consumers are those that eat those primary consumers. Tertiary consumers above them, those high level consumers, like those top predators in an ecosystem. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, please do also remember about carn uh, I'm sorry, decomposers. Decomposers as, as organisms die, and they die in every single level of your uh, ecosystem, whether it's a producer or a top consumer or a tertiary consumer, everybody kicks the bucket at some point. 
and their body parts and also their waste that they give off will be decomposed and returned back to the nutrient cycles. And so decomposers are active at all levels um, of the uh, uh, of your uh, ecosystem. Please do remember also those words autotrophs, our producers are autotrophs. Everything else that's not a producer is a heterotroph. Even the decomposers are heterotrophs, okay? Um, okay, moving on. Now, we talk about energy getting lost. Where, why is their energy getting lost, okay? As this little beetle eats this leaf, okay? It is taking in the uh, energy that that leaf has, but as that an animal makes waste, it is going to be giving off some of the energy that in the waste, in the molecules of the waste, the chemical bonds of the waste, that's energy that's not going to be accept accessible to whatever eats the beetle. Also, as that beetle walks around and uses the physical energy to chew the leaf and all of that, he is doing the process of cellular respiration that is basically converting the raw material in that leaf to energy. Uh, we'll talk much more about that, but the physical act of living and doing processes consumes energy and that's not available. Once that beetle has used some of the energy from this leaf to walk around to some other leaf, that energy he used to walk around is no longer accessible. So energy released in the waste, energy used simply to conduct activities is gone and that is why only a very small amount that is actually remaining in the organism's body, in his physical tissues, when the bird comes and eats him, that is all the energy that that bird is going to get, is what is physically remaining in his tissues. And that is really only about 10% of what this little guy actually consumed in his lifetime. Okay? So only that which is in his physical body goes on to the next level. So that's why we have such a, a, a dramatic reduction. So, a little more detail. Um, about uh, the energy loss in numerical fashion. So let's say Joule is like a calorie. It's a unit of energy, okay? So if we've got one million Joules of sunlight, let's say that the producers got all one million Joules, which is not entirely true either, but the primary consumers eating those plants would only get 100,000 joules because the plants use some of that energy, much of that energy, just to do their own life processes, their own growth, uh, and, and so on. Uh, then the secondary consumers that eat the primary consumers only get a hundred of the hundred thousand joules that those primary consumers had in their lifetime, and so on. So finally, the bottom line is again, it's this, the pyramid gets smaller in terms of energy as it goes up and only about 10% of energy is passed from one level to the next. So that's really, you know, not very much going up and eventually you just don't have enough energy to pass up any further. Okay, so that's an energy pyramid. Looking at this in terms truly of energy, joules, calories, amounts of energy. Uh, pyramids can be based on other things too and this is not a big deal. This is showing that you can have a pyramid of mass if you were doing an experiment on energy transformation um, in an ecosystem, you could mass all of the uh, cons uh, primary producers in a given area and then mass all the primary consumers in that area. And you could, by weight, by dry weight, as it says there, um, simply determine a pyramid and you would end up with similar results. The greatest mass is of the vegetation, of the plants, and, and smaller masses as you go up because it can support less and less and less individuals. In fact, speaking of individuals, uh, you can have a pyramid of numbers in which you literally count individuals in an ecosystem. Uh, you would count the grass plants, count the grasshoppers, uh, so that's a pyramid of numbers and some poor slob has counted 5,842,424 blades of you know, grass plants in this field or whatever. Uh, obviously you couldn't you'd have to take sample sizes and so on. So anyway, so, uh, but the whole idea is the same. The, the greatest amount of energy, the greatest amount of numbers, the greatest amount of weight is at the base of the pyramid and we get smaller as we go up. Uh, this is just a little note 
if you're a vegetarian, you uh, less energy goes into feeding you than if you are a, a omnivore like uh, most of us, um, for obvious reasons. And moving on, talking about ecological footprints, It'd be nice if ours were smaller than they are. Um, Food webs. Everybody knows what this is from when you were little kids. Just don't forget. Uh, it's basically a chart describing who eats whom in, a, in an ecosystem. Um, and uh, it's different from trophic levels in that you're looking at particular feeding relationships uh, between organisms. And, and an organism can fit uh, into a food web at more than one level, especially if you were an omnivore. If you're, a, you know, like a human can eat... Um, spinach, but we can also eat fish, or we can also eat, you know, uh, a cow or whatever. So um, you can fit in at more than one place, and it's quite complex. And a very complex food web is in a very sign of a stable ecosystem. It's when we start eliminating organisms from a nice complex food web like this that we start running into trouble and risking collapse of the whole ecosystem. All right. Finally, this is a separate topic altogether. Uh, pollution uh, in an ecosystem. Uh, this idea somewhat uh, is reminiscent of uh, an energy, energy pyramid in that it builds, um, but in a kind of an opposite way. Um, in this case, we're talking about toxins. Uh, this is called biological magnification. And what this refers to, um, for example, the graphic is of DDT, um, which was a toxin uh, pesticide that was um, prevalent back in the 60s, early 70s, and until they discontinued its use, at least in this country, because of its toxic effects on uh, the ecosystem. What happened was this poison spread on crops to prevent bugs from eating the crops would run off into bodies of water. And you can see down here that very, very small amounts, uh, 0.000000003 parts per million, very small amounts in the water. But the microorganisms that would absorb this toxin into their tissues would concentrate it because it is, they can't process it out. Once a living thing gets DDT in its system, it stays in its system, it builds up. And so all of a sudden it's concentrating at a higher level in the zooplankton. And then of course the fish that eat them concentrate it in an even higher level in their tissues, so on, until by the time you get to the top predator, ospreys for example, bald eagles for example, 25 parts per million is high enough to cause some serious toxic effects. So uh, other chemicals work the same way, PCBs, Mercury poisoning works the same way. These are toxins that once they are in your body, you don't get rid of them. They just build up if you keep getting them into your body. So um, we've already talked about all of this. Um, so um, as we moved up the food chain, it built up in toxicity. And basically the effect in this case for DDT was that it weakened the eggs to the point where once the birds sat on their eggs to incubate them, they would crush their own eggs. Um, uh, pelicans were affected, ospreys, bald eagles, uh, and so on. And since that has been, elim been eliminated, a uh, big uh, uh, resurgence in numbers of these birds uh, has been that bald eagles have been, for better or worse, removed from the endangered species list. Ospreys are plentiful, so uh, environmental toxins have a huge effect. What you're looking at here is the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, and that is the creation of um, dead zones due to oxygen depletion. Okay? Eutrophication. We will talk about this when we come in this year and do our one of our very first labs, maybe not the first, but one of the first. Eutrophication is where we're not talking about an environmental toxin per se, a poison. We're talking about a nutrient, but there's too much of it. So we all, let's say, put fertilizers on our grasses and our yards to make them grow. Fine. The rain comes, runs them off into a creek, into a pond. Um, that pond is getting lots and lots of nutrient, maybe nitrogen, maybe phosphorus. Okay, um, And so the 
aquatic life in the pond responds to that nutrient um, and begins to grow in excess. Well, what's wrong with that? It's just more algae for fish to eat, right? Well, if it grows and grows and grows and grows in excess, then um, it begins to maybe block the light that is coming through down to the lower layers, okay? So, eutrophication is a nutrient runoff problem that increases the amount of algae. Um, as the algae blooms or grows in excess, um, blocking layers of, of the water underneath from light, the algae in the lower layers begins to die in huge numbers. This is where the problem comes in because when things die, they get decomposed by bacteria. When bacteria begin to decay the dead algae, the bacteria use up oxygen because bacteria are using the process of cell respiration. Photosynthesis that the algae do puts oxygen in the water, but cell respiration that those bacteria are doing when they eat this dying algae takes oxygen out of the water. Why is that bad? Well, if the bacteria are taking up all the oxygen by doing their decomposition activities, they suck the oxygen basically out of the water and anything that depends on oxygen, like the heterotrophs in the water, the fish, the, uh, and so on, um, will die. Um, now, what this shows is a um, dead zone from, what, 2008. Uh, that extended. The worst part of it is in the red, uh, but obviously extending an enormous length of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and uh, we have another dead zone uh, rising this summer um, due to nutrient runoff. Um, and I saw an article about it. I think I posted it on our Facebook page, um, and I haven't heard any more in a couple weeks about it. But uh, it, it happens pretty much every summer, some years worse than others. Um, so this problem, um, more than um, even pure poisons uh, in, in our water supply, uh, this problem is probably the Bay's greatest difficulty because uh, it is, you know, there's no single point for this kind of pollutant. Everybody uses fertilizers, farmers, homeowners. It's, it's kind of a generalized pollutant that's, that's running off from everywhere. And how do you control it? How do you stop it? Uh, it depends on everybody to take responsibility, and that's kind of a hard thing for some of us to do sometimes. So uh, that's it. That's what you need to know from this PowerPoint. We'll be back uh, soon with um, uh, other ecology PowerPoints, and uh, thanks a lot, and hope you're having a great summer. Bye.